I'm so delighted to be able to talk about a subject that is so good that I believe that Jesus wants to install it as the operating system of our lives. Just like your phone has an operating system and your computer has an operating system, in many ways, so do you and I. How you think, how you talk, how you make your decisions are all based upon the operating system that's controlling you kind of behind and beneath the surface of your lives. And in many ways, like our computers and our phones, the operating system of our lives can get hacked. Do you know that? Like the devil can come in, kind of try to corrupt it, put some viruses in there, um, bog it down with all kinds of things so it runs really slowly. In fact, those of you that are Apple users, how many recognize this icon right here? And that, that icon is actually called what? The, wheel of death. the spinning wheel of death. <laughs> Isn't it funny, something so beautiful, Apple called the spinning wheel of death. Well, I'm here to give you some good news. You were born with the spinning wheel of death. You're welcome. I'm here all day, all right? I'm here to give you some good news. So, no, no the, the reality is, though, you got to recognize where you start, that spiritually speaking, you and I started with the corruption on the inside. That's why we don't just need a Jesus app we need a new installation. We need him to come in and change the old corrupted operating system and put in himself, his Holy Spirit into our lives so that we can actually accomplish and live the way that he wants us to live. I wanna give you one of the great verses about that. This is from the book of Ephesians. If you're new to the Bible, uh, we call it a book, but it really was a letter to a group of people very much like us. Ephesus was a local group of Christians gathering together like we are. And the Apostle Paul, who is being used by God to write to them God's words, one day got a letter. I got to think that the pastor stood up in front of a congregation just like this and read that letter like I'm going to read part of it to you today. It says this, for as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins. There's the spinning wheel of death right there. You don't just need to get better. How many know that in Jesus, you need to come alive? So dead people don't need to get better. Dead people need to come alive. So Jesus said, you are dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler and kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those of us who are disobedient, in all of us that were disobedient. All of us, say all of us. All of us, all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the, nature, uh, the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. That's the default setting right there. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath, but, in fact, say, but God. But because of his great mercy, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even though we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. There's the new operating system. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. So rather than getting an operating system called El Capitan, <laughs> Mojave, those of you Apple users, you know what I'm talking about. All the rest of you, I'm speaking Greek to you, but um, Sonoma, that's the latest. You know, I got Sonoma on my computer. Big deal. This says heavenly realms, ha <laughs> ha, right there. How about that for the operating system of your lives? In order that in the coming age, he might show you the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and it is not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works so that no one could boast. And read the rest of this with me. Verse 10, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That's a very significant and theological way to say salvation isn't the destination. Salvation is the starting point. Forgiveness of sin starts us off with new life in Christ so that we're not just saved going to heaven, we're new creations, we're his masterpiece doing good work now before we get to heaven. The ultimate upgrade is called salvation. And praise God, that's a free gift. So Jesus paid for it all on the cross. He offers it to any and everyone who wants it. But like new things, you gotta learn how to use the new thing. 
Salvation is the starting point. Spiritual growth is the process by which we become more like Jesus. It's the process by which we begin to live out the way in which God intended us to live in the first place. I wanna talk about and apply that to living big-hearted and open-handed. Big-hearted, say that. Open-handed. Without Jesus, our natural bent is to live self-centered. This is why no parent ever had to teach their child to say mine. If you have two children in your house, there will be events that happen around the world, the word mine. And one child will be running down the hallway with a toy in his or her hand saying, mine, 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 the toy is mine. And there's not a single parent in any language of mine that ever had to teach their child to do that. It came to them by their nature. Remember a number of years ago, um, taking one of my daughters to her favorite restaurant and after we looked over the menu, I ordered a Big Mac for me and (laughs) a happy meal for her. Okay, maybe it was a little bit longer than just a few years ago, but, and, uh, and don't judge me. It's the best we could do back in the day. And um, happy meals were intended to make your child happy. We needed all the help we could get. And for $3, for $3 a kid, it didn't really matter if the chicken nuggets weren't chicken. (laughs) I told you, don't judge me. Chick-fil-A wasn't in the area yet. Some of you don't even know what life is like without Chick-fil-A. But here we are. And we're at this, this um, restaurant and inside the Happy Meal is not only a hamburger, um, not only a toy, um, there's, and then you have your drink, there's also fries. And in spite of the fact that I'm not sure what the chicken nuggets were, the fries were awesome. I still think they're awesome, as long as they're hot. Because when they're not hot, do they not morph to something else? Do they not get spongy and weird and, and awful and, uh, and they can live under the car seat of your child's car seat for two years? Like they will be there and they'll, be, they'll look exactly the same two years from now. But well, they're hot. Oh, they're good. And so I remember this particular time not ordering fries for myself. I don't know why, but, but uh, during the meal, I reach over to her Happy Meal to take one lone fry only to whereby my about three and a half foot daughter at the time looked me straight in the eye and said, no, daddy, those are mine. (laughs) She forgot three things. Number one, I am the source of her fries. (laughs) I am her fry king. Without me, there are no fries. There is no happy meal. There is no happy, there's no, to- there's not even, there's not even McDonald happiness. <laughs> then second, she didn't know I controlled the fries. I'm bigger than her. I could reach over and take the whole bag if I wanted. I could eat every one of her fries in front of her and say, your fries? Nice try, little girl. My fries. I paid for them, they're my fries. Or I could do the opposite. I could actually go to the counter and order 10 more bags of fries and pour them all over her because I control the fries. And then she forgot this. I didn't need her fries. I didn't need her fries. I can go get my own. I didn't need hers. Isn't it funny how little children don't understand what adults understand intuitively? Because there's no adult that ever does this. No adult ever would be so ridiculous to go through life going, mine, mine, God, mine, 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 mine. We're all, we're, we all, when we hit our 20s, become open-handed and big-hearted, don't we? Why are you laughing like that? So you're aware of the, of the, the install upgrade that needs to be learned how to be used. Because in you, if Christ is in you, the capacity to be big-hearted and open-handed is in you. It's actually your default operating system. But you gotta learn how to operate with it, cooperate with it. 
I wanna give you a couple of my favorite verses on this, things that have impacted my life, impacted my kids and our church. And one of them is Proverbs 11. Yeah, and by the way, uh, this is one, of, I would consider this like a life verse for me. If you've never done this before, the Bible says all scripture is profitable, okay? But I believe some verses are really personal. I believe some of them kind of jump out at you and you feel like, I don't know that that's just a good verse to follow as much as it's loftier than that, so much so that you might actually say, I regularly come back to that. That's defining me. That's what I want my life to be known for. I would put this verse in that category for me. This is from the message. The world of the generous gets larger and larger. The world of the stingy gets smaller and smaller. The one who blesses others is abundantly blessed and those who help others are helped. Verse 24 in many ways is more about your heart. Verse 25 is a little bit more about your hands. But let's start with verse 24. It says stingy. That's a heart condition. That's like having spiritually clogged arteries if your heart is described by the word stingy. But so is the word generous. It's a spiritual heart condition. It's where actually things are flowing through your veins freely the way God intended. I actually believe that it's like oxygen rich, spiritually speaking, so that your life is better and other people's lives are better. You got the bad spiritual cholesterol out and now you're living the way God wanted you to live. Verse 25, I actually think looks like this. Open-handed, open-hearted, big-hearted, open-handed, not, not this, not this, not all worried. It's this. Go through life like this. I have a thing with uh, two of our grandkids uh, and they're actually part of this church because they're joint dance kids. And, and it's the four-year-old and the two-year-old. And so the four-year-old is Eliana, two-year-old is Wesley. And um, when I see them, I'll play this little game, big squeeze or little squeeze? Because they don't have an option. I'm coming. So Eliana oftentimes, you know, she's the four-year-old and she's the girl and she'll say, little squeeze. But it always changes to big squeeze afterwards. Like, oh, he's, you know, like I barely even touch her. You know, little squeeze. Okay, big squeeze. Wesley, it's big or go home. Like, it's, it's big squeeze, turn, in, in, turn into all-star wrestling. Like, he just wants, it would, so we even did it this morning in the lobby. I go big squeeze, because big squeeze. And so I squeeze him. And the harder I do it, the, the more love he has. Like, he's squealing. But he loves it. I actually think God does a version of this to us. Big blessing or little blessing? And he answers it based upon you and me <laughs> or this. God looks at us and says, oh, there's big blessing right there. Like that's an open-hearted, big-hearted, open-handed person. I'm gonna make the world of that person and the blessing of that person greater. Guess what the cross is? Is that not the clearest, definitive, once and for all answer from God? How am I? I am big hearted and open handed. That's Jesus. So I love that. I'm going to love Isaiah 32. Generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm on their generosity. If I can alter the word stand just slightly to make a point, and I believe it's still consistent with the translation, but it'd be like generous person don't, generous people don't just do generous deeds. They have a generous standing. They stand in something. It's not just something they do, like random one-off acts of kindness. It's character. It's who they are. It's their default setting. It's their mindset. I'll say a couple things about this verse, but let me give you a little Bible tool if you haven't found it yet on the internet. Um, I actually love biblehub.com, biblehub.com. Uh, there's a number of different you know, uh, Bible websites where there's translations. This one for me, it's just the fastest and the easiest. And the reason why I like translations to see them at different times is because, and I, I, maybe a lot of you know this, but in case you don't, the Bible was not written in English. So, or whatever your, your, your you know, number one language is, unless it's Hebrew. Any Hebrew people, that, like that's your primary language? Okay, probably not. Greek? Still none. Aramaic? Maybe a couple. Okay. Those are the three Bible languages. So anything that you read 
in the Bible that's not Hebrew, Greek, or Aramaic is a translation. And like any translation, a translator doesn't have just one word or one way to interpret a sentence. There's nuances. Just like we have in English, a word can mean multiple things or multiple words can mean a same thing. And so sometimes I wanna see if Bible translators, when they came across a word, happened to consistently use that word or did they actually operate in a sense that other words seem to come out, which is the case with Isaiah 32. Because it could be translated generosity. It could be translated honorable. It could be translated noble. Isn't it interesting? In, in the Hebrew language, all of those are very synonymous. In other words, if you're generous, if you're honorable, that's about as noble yes. of a way to live as you can live. Like it's higher, it's better. It's God's way. Well, I also like the word plans there. That they plan it. So the generous person or the honorable person plans their generosity or their honor. The noble person thinks in noble ways and they plan to live that way. It's not just random, accidental, every so often I do it. It's like, I think this way, I plan it, I'm proactive. I love that there was a time when the character in the Old Testament named King David is established now as the king. He's been on the run from his predecessor for years, but he's now established as the king. And he asks a very provocative question. He says, is there no one left in the house of Saul, his predecessor, not to whom I can go kill, not to whom I can marginalize, not to whom I can make sure is as far away from my kingdom as possible. He says, is there no one left in the house of Saul to whom I can show kindness? Who thinks like that? Noble people. Generous people. Honorable people. And they find this kid named Mephibosheth. Say Mephibosheth. Good try. <laughs> Do it one more time. Mephibosheth. That was better. That's just a fun name to say. Don't name your child that, but um, that'd be too hard to carry that name in the modern society. But in the Bible times, I bet that was cool. Mephibosheth. They bring him to the palace. He, um, he's been in many ways living kind of in an exile land. He got deformed earlier in life and so he's crippled. And I love that David says, bring me the son. Bring me the son. Not the crippled kid, not my enemy's son. Bring me the son. And then he tells him, don't be afraid. I will be kind to you for your father Jonathan's sake. This is the grandson, so there's Saul, Jonathan, and Mephibosheth. I will give you back all the land your grand, of your, your grandfather Saul, and you will always eat at my table. So Mephibosheth ate at David's table as if he were one of the king's sons. Come on. In a world of mine, 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 Here's David, establishing, established in his kingdom and not living entitled, not living pitiful, not living stingy, living generous, living honorable, and living noble. God help us to be that kind of people where we're big hearted and open handed. I do know that there are ways in which when we do this, it doesn't just benefit you, if you're, if you're parents, it'll impact your kids. It'll impact your grandkids. David, David disrupted the cycle Saul started, which was insecurity, jealousy, pettiness, anger, and all kinds of messed up things. I actually believe that David was the one who somewhat grabbed a hold of someone else's spiritual DNA and hijacked it over to the right side so that Mephibosheth could experience this kind of thing in his household now, even if he didn't experience it in his grandfather's household. So this is about you, this is about your grandkids, this is about your friends, this is about your coworkers, what God can do in and through these kinds of things. So let me give you two applications to this and we'll apply it to our lives and then we'll apply it to us as a church too. Number one, ask the Lord to change anything in you that does not reflect his heart in his hands. 
This has been very convicting for me too, to basically say, Lord, where am I not publicly or privately reflecting you? I, I wanna change those things because all of us are a work of progress, a work in progress. All of us need to continually change and become more and more like Jesus. So it's a great thing to ask, God, what needs to be changed and change it? I heard a phrase a number of years ago that I really have loved and it's helped me. The condition of my heart is not dependent on the behavior of others. Let me say that again. The condition of my heart is not dependent upon the behavior of others. Could you say that with me? The condition of my heart is not dependent on the behavior of others. In other words, somebody might've contributed to the original problem, okay? They might've wounded you. They might've created some insecurity in you. They might have done some damage. They might have created arrogance in you or a whole host of other kinds of things. Some people can have a way uh, in which they input their ways upon you, but if it stays in you, especially after Jesus, that's on you. That's on you. Because God never intended you to continue to live with a wounded heart, an arrogant heart, a bitter heart, a broken heart. I, I discovered this. I don't need a co-signer for God to change my heart. I don't need to go out there and get anybody else to sign off on it. I can say to God, I give you authorization, Jesus, to come in and change my heart. Because my heart, my responsibility. One more time. My heart, my responsibility. And when we live that way, we're not going around taking a you know, spiritual pulse of everybody else's opinions of how to behave. Anyway, I think it was attributed to Benjamin Franklin, whoever it was, it was a clever line. You can't keep all the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest in your hair. Right? You can't stop all things from happening to you, but you can decide whether it's gonna stay in you. And so we ask the Lord for his help. And then number two, ask the Lord to leverage, say leverage, Leverage more of your heart and hands to build his church and advance his mission, to leverage that. My friends, when you get to the end of your life, there'll be nothing more important than this one. Assuming, you know, not only do you have Jesus in your heart and your kids and your grandkids and your friends all have Jesus in their heart, but I'm just saying that you don't wanna just bring the bare minimum. You wanna get to the end and you wanna have built what Jesus is building, which is his church, and you wanna reflect what Jesus is reflecting, which is his grace. And nothing matters more to God than people finding salvation through his son, Jesus Christ. Nothing matters more. I do not want you to wind up in heaven and one day say, well, Jesus, my pastors weren't very clear on that point. I didn't know lost people mattered that much to you. I didn't know your church was such a big deal. I just thought that you wanted me to go there, get some good stuff to make me feel better. I didn't know you wanted me to help build it. So Jesus, even though I didn't do really well in those two, can I show you my golf score? Because it's good. Can I show you my bucket list? Because I got some really cool pictures of where I got to go in my lifetime. And God, maybe sit down for this one. I'm about ready to show you my net worth. I don't want you to fall over when you see it because it's really impressive. Now, I'm not saying none of those things matter. I think God loves you know, us to have fun and enjoy things and he can bless us and net worth and all that kind of stuff is all part of it. But you know where that is? Down here. You know where his church is and bringing people to Jesus? Way up here. So when you get there, I hope you wanna be like me. When I see Jesus face to face, I wanna, I wanna feel like Crystal's there and my kids are there and my grandkids are there, my great, great grandkids are there and you're all there and you, you have your kids and your great grandkids and then we have this line of people where we can't even see the end of it. Of all the people we influence together, where we would say, well, Jesus, I brought a few with us. We influenced a few in our lifetime. We decided not to go through life saying, mine, mine, mine. We decided to go through saying, yours, yours, yours. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Our mission at New Life Church is to see more people, say more people, to invite more people to be filled up with new life in Jesus. So over the years, you know, 26 years ago, that for us, it meant, hey, we'll go to a movie theater. We'll set up and tear down in a movie theater in Crow Canyon Cinemas for five years. Set up and tore down. And I um, loved it. 
And then when our Alamo facility opened up to us, we said, hey, if it's moving out of the movie theater to go up there to another town different from San Ramon, because that's where we started, let's move there because I think we can be more effective with a permanent building. And so we did that. And then a little while later, we said, what if we planted back into San Ramon? Let's set up and tear down all over again in a school. Some of you were there during those days. And we set up and tore down all over again for five or six years or whatever it was. We introduced video teaching at that time And we said, you know what? Let's leverage technology. Let's just try something. Let's just see if God can use this. And and it was valuable and good. That story actually merged into this story because when it came time to actually move to more permanent facilities from San Ramon, we actually found this building right here. So one more time, all over again, we said, well, let's stop that story to grab a hold of the better story because I think now the Dublin story is going to allow us to leverage more people for Jesus and reach more people more effectively because the question has never been, what's the easiest? The question has been, what's the most effective? And um, that's why we've planted churches over the years too. God's blessed us with some really fun and great stories. I I remember the first time, and someday you'll hear more of this story, but you know, uh, there's a church in San Francisco right now under the name of Canvas. But I remember the first time Chris and I had a conversation with this young kid moving from Arizona to San Francisco and he knew no one. And then all of a sudden God put us together and we helped leverage that story so that we could feel like, you know what? We had a, we had a, a hand in planting a church in San Francisco under a different name than New Life. We did that down in Mexico. Guess what the name of that church is? Open Arms. Oh, that's interesting. That's a great not line too. There's a church in Kenya. It's called the Journey Church. That's awesome. There, we had worship leaders that, that helped us lead worship on this stage, Luke and Tracy. They moved up to Seattle. They wanted to plant a church. We said, do we do that? Do we help people outside of California? I know we help people outside the world, but do we help outside of the United States, but do we help people in other states? Oh yeah, I know some of those people up in Washington. They're ungodly too. Maybe we should help that church. So West Coast Church starts up in in the Seattle area and we got a chance to be a part of that. And so all those things have been great and fun. But we noticed something after 2020, a couple different shifts. One is um, when we came back into buildings, video teaching did not feel the same anymore. We evaluated it for a little while and we felt like it's not as effective as it used to be. And um, so out of the same heart, we wanna be the best we can with the tools that we have, but this time that tool that we started and have used and asked many of you to, to experience, we actually said, let's literally pull the plug on that. Because by that time we were simulcasting back and forth from Alamo to here and, and a number of things. And so now all we broadcast to is the internet for people who don't live in the area and who, and who are in their homes and can't come to our buildings. That's why we do that. We do it only online. And we actually started saying, I, I think God's given us some great um, teaching team staff members that we should incorporate it. So that's become the better, the better plan. Well, what that did created a second shift. And I actually feel like I can tell this part of the story better if I invite Crystal out and Joy and Dan to come out and... Um, and so, oh, I don't know, we don't always do this, but welcome them. It's like, I feel like they're coming from the backstage. You should welcome them. Um, I think most of you know this, but if you don't, Joy is our actual daughter. I think she's the one I took to McDonald's that might've said mine. <laughs> I don't know, probably not. I don't know, she's got two other sisters. But uh, there was a time where Joy got uh, uh, older, graduated from high school, and she had plans to, the audacity, to leave us and go to college. How horrible would that be for a kid that you invest all this time and money in to say, dad, mom, will you let me go? And will you open up your heart and your wallet? (laughs) Because it's gonna be expensive. So we do that and we bless her and we release her and then we kick her out of the house. And then all of a sudden, here comes this guy into her, her life. His name is Dan Levy. And he convinces her that he's better with him than us. I can't imagine why. And sweeps her off her feet and proposes to her. And then literally right on this stage, this actual stage, they did their wedding ceremony and exchanged their vows and said, I do to each other. And one more time, here we are, and we bless them. And, and, and we say, 
don't, don't keep asking us for more money. No, no. <laughs> go and have, go and do life together and, and enjoy it and give us some grandkids. That's what we ask for. <laughs> keep them coming. Yeah, Be fruitful coming. and multiply. <laughs> yeah. and, and that was the better story. Well, more recently, and most of you know this, this is why even when I came up here, you haven't seen Crystal and I here as, as frequently because it was like, get out of the way because there's a calling on their lives and let God release that calling. And then we started seeing this in you. So let me put them to the side just for a moment. We actually started seeing the Dublin campus, all of you rise up, get behind them, start doing some things that was better and bigger in many ways. Uh, by the way, how many people came to Easter? Roughly? 650. About 650 people showed up here for Easter. And uh, we started feeling like we're seeing something that God is up to. And so one more time, all over again, we started saying, I think there's something better than multi-site. And I'm not saying multi-site is over for every church and it's not a good method. But for us, we started seeing it like video technology. It was a good tool to use for a certain amount of time, but we actually believe, ultimately, we've always believed in the local church. And so in this case, multi-site has had two locations here, you know, on the East Bay that we've been a part of, but we actually have felt like there's certain things that have tethered us together that are good. And actually then some things that have tethered us together in such a way that we don't feel as effective as we could be if we broke the tethering of multi-site and created two churches rather than one. What that means is Dan and Joy are gonna move from campus pastors to the senior pastors of the new location right here in Dublin. Yeah. And, um, <laughs> which also means this, it's not just more for them, it's more for all of you. Yes. <laughs> they need you. They love you. There's things God's going to do that is bigger and better than they, that they need you. And for the next four to six months, there's a lot of work behind the scenes to actually get it to a place where you take multi-site and turn it into two local congregations. That will involve a relaunch of this campus and a grand opening of a brand new church with a different name than New Life even. And Crystal and I are not abandoning them. We're yeah. launching them. Yeah. We're not abandoning you. We're releasing you. Yes. And and empowering you, and we're going to be celebrating a grand opening of a brand new church all over again. It's been something that's been part of our lives for a long time, and now we get to do it with all of you. Wow. Amen. Wow. Now, let me answer a couple questions that might be rattling in your brain right now. First of all, you might be saying, how does this affect me? Well, in some ways, not at all. And in other ways, significant. Late. Here's where it won't affect you at all. Next Sunday, you'll still get in your car, you'll drive to the same location at the same time, and probably sit in the same seat that you have sat in the last six months or six years. Like, like that'll all look exactly the same. Uh, but here's what's gonna start changing. God's gonna start rise, raising up inside of you a call to do more for the launch of something. Because I wanna tell you something about the early days of a church plant. Crystal and I have it in our minds. We've loved all 26 years, but I will tell you, I have images in my mind of the first year that are cemented in my mind. I might forget my grandkids' names some days, but I have pictures <laughs> in my head of what happened in the first year of New Life Church in the Crow Canyon Cinemas. I still can go into that theater. It's closed now, but when it was open, I could go in there I could smell the popcorn on Sunday morning. I knew what rooms we set up children's ministry in. I knew where we had church service in there. There's something about, like, we've coveted that building. It's empty now, and there's been different times where he said, I don't know, we should try to get that building. But, you know, like, I don't need to go live the past. I'd rather live the future. But I have very vivid memories of first year. God's gonna give you that story here. You're gonna, some of you are gonna rise up and do some things in the first year of this church that will create a ripple effect down to your grandkids. Yes. I'm telling you, it'll be better than you even think what God is up to. 
What are Crystal and I are gonna be doing? We're gonna be doing what we've been doing in this valley for 26 years. We're just gonna be down the road. Our primary campus has been Alamo all these years and we're gonna be there. And then um, we're gonna do some things together. And there's gonna be a few events hosted here throughout the year that we would do together. Dan has us on speed dial. <laughs> You know, he'll call in whenever he you know, wants us to speak or do whatever, and we'll come and you know, bless you and however we can. Besides that, our grandkids are here, so you're not getting rid of us that easily. You know? um, but about uh, sometime this fall, all the details haven't been figured out yet, but this fall there'll be a grand opening. So talk a little bit about when and where and how that looks like, and then you guys share a little bit of that. And then what we wanna do is we're gonna pray over you because this is not just their commissioning, it's your commissioning. There's still a grand opening and all that. There's actually an installation and official service we'll have in the future. But this is an announcement of significance for all of you to get excited about. So share a little bit about that, Dan, and then we're gonna pray for you guys and pray for the congregation. Yeah, church family, we're so full of faith over what God has in store uh, in this upcoming season, in, in the years to come. Uh, I'll talk about some dates, but before I do, just a little bit of, of uh, just a couple things I wanna share first. Pastor Doug and Pastor Crystal. We honor you. We honor your yes to Jesus, yes. We honor your yes to Jesus 26 years ago, but we honor the ongoing yes to Jesus you've made for 26 years, equipping, sending, launching church planters all across the world for the glory of God. We honor your impact. Hundreds, if not thousands of people have been baptized, saved, set free. Marriages have been restored, healed. People have been delivered from darkness. People have been healed because of your yes to Jesus. And we honor you today. We love you today. And it is a privilege and the honor of a lifetime to build upon the faithful legacy Amen. that you guys have laid. Come on. The second thing I, I just want to underscore, uh, Joy and I want to underscore, uh, is that this isn't a time of, of going backward. It's a, it's a time of moving forward. We, we believe with confidence that the best days are still yet ahead of us mm -hmm. in Christ yeah. Jesus. The Bay Area is a mission field, by the way, that God has placed all of us in for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Jesus himself has placed us here for what he wants to see occur in this region. And we all get the collective possibility of being a part of that story. His call is upon our lives. We believe this involves us as a church family. We believe it involves you. We see, we see God's presence filling this place Amen. in ways that we have yet to expect, that we've yet, have yet to experience before. We see a house of miracles. We, we see a place where, where sick people are healed, where marriages are restored, where, where people are set free and delivered, where purpose will be discovered and hope will be found. We see a church where your kids and your grandkids, they are going to encounter Jesus for themselves. They're going to get rooted and planted in the house of the Lord. And there's gonna be God-given calling and destiny Amen. that is spoken over their life. And they're gonna follow the ways and the purposes of God in a crooked generation. We see people that are close to you, but far from God coming into this house and encountering Jesus for himself. Come on, we're, we're believing that spouses that aren't saved, that family members that aren't saved, that coworkers that aren't saved, that friends that aren't saved are gonna receive Jesus into their lives. We see prodigal sons and daughters coming home. Come on, for those that, that have been leaning in for sons and daughters to come home, we believe this is a season of prodigal sons yeah. and daughters coming home. We see youth and young adults across the Bay Area encountering the spirit of Jesus and getting set on fire for the yeah. kingdom of God. We see the Tri-Valley transformed by the presence of God because, because here's the thing, we made the decision to carry the spirit of Jesus, the presence of Jesus, everywhere we go to everyone we meet. Come on, we don't just see a church building with people in it. We see a family that's knit together in unity and in love, holding one another in prayer, doing life together. We're in this together. And friend, we see God doing more in you, for you, and through you because of your commitment to be planted in the house of the Lord. And we know that as you serve Jesus and you sow into this house with your time, gifting, and resources, that he's gonna return it unto you in ways that are un 
imaginable. In Ephesians chapter three, verses 20, this passage came to my heart. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than we all, than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever, amen. This is a season of the immeasurably more. The immeasurably more for our church, the immeasurably more for you as an individual, the immeasurably more for your family. This is a season of the immeasurably more in you, through you, and for you. Yes. I see faith rising. I see joy erupting. I see hope overflowing. I see Esther's and Mordecai's arising. Come on. I hear the voice of the Lord saying, for such a time yeah. as this. Yeah. Amen. for such a time yep. as this. Many of you who have even sat, this is the time of arising. Yes. I, I believe I saw in prayer, I saw a picture of, of men and women who have been sitting and maybe it's been a season of restoration. It's been a season of healing. It's been a season of receiving. And this is the hour of such a time as this, right. where I believe the Esther's and the Mordecai's are going to arise on behalf of what God wants to do here in the Bay Area, in your family, in your life. And I believe in schools and in your workplace places as you will go and you'll carry the presence of God into every sphere of influence that you walk into every room you walk into you're carrying his presence come on amen. come on amen a couple things uh practically in terms of dates coming up uh is a launch date pastor Doug referenced this in the fall of this year we're, we're still landing details on a specific Sunday but in the fall of this year there will be a relaunch date and we're really excited about that. We're praying over that. We're fasting over that. And we would invite you to be a part of that as well. But second, we have an open house coming up on Sunday, May 5th in the evening at 5.30 p.m. I believe we have a slide for this with a QR code. There we go. Dublin Church open house, May 5th at 5.30 p.m. It will be here at our Dublin campus. There will be food. It will be a time of vision casting and sharing about the heart of what is ahead. And we would invite you to come and be a part with us. It's gonna be a fun time of vision, dreaming, mm -hmm. praying, planning together. So. Yes, yes. And if, and if you can, if you are RSVP, it helps us to know how to prepare. Yes. And we would love to have you at Open House. Again, for such a time. So there's a QR code there. You use that to sign up. And so, yes. Yeah. <laughs> so in just a minute, I want to pray for you. But first, I want, to, I want you to hear from Mama. <laughs> Mama in the house. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I'm taken back to... Um, the years that, over the years, right prior to Doug and I stepping out and planting. And there was this anticipation. I mean, way even before we actually stepped away from the position that we were on, there was a stirring that was rising up inside of me. I knew what I was wired for. We were wired for church planting. And we would drive back and forth the corridor from Pittsburgh to Pleasanton. And we would dream. We would dream about this. We would dream, God, where are you wanting us to plant ourselves? What does that look like? A place where we had little children. Our youngest was three and seven and eight. And where could they connect? Where would be their connection of friends? Where would that nucleus be? We didn't have answers. We just had a heart. We had a heart and a compelling to step out and to trust God in greater things. And I want you to know something. In that dream, we also thought about the position in place of our children. Can I just tell you, this is the grand dream. This is the dream. It has come full circle. For us to be able to say, you have the wiring, you have the calling, you have the anointing, you have the compelling. 
and it is beautiful. And I know that this family is going to rise up behind you with everything it is to move the gospel forward because it's all about us as a family reaching the kingdom of Come God. On. Come on. He sees you. He hears you. He knows the desires of your heart. And I just want you to know this is an amazing opportunity for you. You might be thinking, what is in it for me? There is a huge opportunity for you to rise up yes. in a place that maybe you've wondered, God, what, how do you want to use me? What do you want to do through me? How can I reach out and bring others in? We're going to pray for that, but I want you to know your openness, your yes, your yes will compel people into the house of God. People will become saved. People will come, they find their place of, of, of belonging through your yes. Pray for Doug, or pray for, pray for, pray for Dan and Joy. I'll get you in there, babe. Pray for Dan and Joy, especially for the next four to six months, because this is a lot of logistics to come into place. But we're family. We're not going to leave anybody high and dry. You know, that's not how we do things. But pray for them. Ask the Lord, Father, how are you nudging me? What is it that you want me to do? How can I step in? I have so much faith. I can't tell you. It's because I'm wired this way. I have so much faith for what God wants to do in you and through you as you rise yes. up and say, yes, yes Lord, use me. Mm -hmm. I want to encourage you to be planted. Yeah. Choose to be planted. Choose to be planted. His word says, those that are planted in the house yes. will flourish yes. in the courts of our God. Yes. Choose to be planted. Let your roots grow down deep in his marvelous love. Ask the Lord, how can I leverage myself? Just like Doug said, how can I leverage my heart and how can I leverage my hands? I want to ask you to stand with me. Father, I thank you for every single man, woman in this house. Lord, I thank you for them. Lord, I know that you are at work in our lives. Lord, I thank you that you have a plan, just like you've told us in Jeremiah 29, 11, and 12, for I know the plan I have for you. Just like Jeremiah said, the prophet said, I know the plan I have for you declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you, but plans to give you a hope and a future. And when you come and pray, just like Dan said earlier, when you come and pray, my God hears your prayers. Father, I thank you for your presence in the room right now. I thank you, Lord, for your, the birthing pain of what it is that you're going to do right now. Lord, I thank you, Father, for every man, woman, boy and girl in this house and how you want to leverage them for the kingdom of God, how they can envision their friends, how they can envision their coworker and family walking through the doors, finding you. Lord, it begins with one, and that one goes into the family, and that family goes to the neighborhood, and that neighborhood goes to the community and that community goes to the the region and that region goes to the state this house will impact you globally father for the kingdom of God we love you father we praise you Lord speak to us father thank you father all the glory goes to you in Jesus name amen, amen. Now stay amen. standing stay standing hold on um, I got some I got some people in the back that are gonna come out and they're gonna represent you on stage. But I also want you to feel like you're, you're extending your hand towards these friends and pastors, leaders, family members. And so I wanna pray over them. This is a, a commissioning moment. We'll have later on, like I said, there'll be months down the road when we're officially uh, install them as the senior pastors of the church. Then there'll be a grand opening date. So there's a lot of fun things on the horizon. I feel like these guys need to kneel down. Okay. All right, this consecrated moment. Um, I want you to put your hands forward toward them. 
Jesus, thank you for the call of God in our lives. As Crystal just prayed for every person in this room and those listening online, the call that you have for them is different than the call for joined in, but it is, it is interconnected. As people are lift, pushing their hand toward this couple, we're laying hands on them. Jesus, you are uniting them together with this church body in such a way that there's effective things that are gonna happen in the kingdom of God. We're not going for the easy, we're going for the effective. We're not going for the little, we're going for the much. Our hearts are big. Our hands are open. We're releasing your power, Lord, all over again in and through their lives. So Jesus, let your hand be upon their ideas. Let conversations be anointed and seasoned with grace and goodness and favor. Lord, let some of the best days of friendship, Lord, occur. Lord, in the days ahead. Generosity occur in the days ahead. I'm already praying for blessing to be poured, Lord, in and through this house. It's a house of blessing, Lord, that you're going to use, as Crystal said, literally to even make impact around the world. So Jesus, we lay hands on Joy and Dan today. Let your... Uh, your relationship with them get richer. The strength of the joy within them make them stronger. The eyes of discernment to make them better. The ears of hearing your word to be more clear. Their mouths to be more crisp and, and full of grace and faith. I'm, I'm, believe, I'm seeing right now them speaking words that are going to produce faith in people in this room right now. Faith is gonna rise up. I, I believe I'm supposed to even right now against any fear that's coming up into anybody's mind or heart. Lord, favor is being released. Faith is being released. Goodness is being released. Hallelujah. Thank you for that, Jesus. We're going to now celebrate you and celebrate it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.